A few weeks ago, I talked with Dr. Sally Riggs about five psychological strategies to help you deal with long COVID. Uh, the link is here. So today we're following up with some of your questions that came out of that discussion, as there's uh, no question that half the battle with the condition is trying to keep mind and soul together when the body is coming up with new ways to stitch you up just about every day. Uh, so thank you for joining me again, Sally. Um, let's start with a question that's um, sort of close to my heart, and that is, in this game of snakes and ladders, how do we deal with repeated setbacks? Um, because I've got a feeling that they might get harder each time we have one. We get, you know, you can sort of tolerate one, two, three extinguishings of the light at the end of the tunnel. But what happens when it keeps on happening? What sort of, yeah. how do we best approach that? I think it's, um, you're right, it's very easy when we've made some progress and then we feel awful again to, um, to be overwhelmed by that and to sort of have that kind of losing hope moment and um, starting to think, you know, this isn't going to uh, get better after all. I, I think, um, and, and a lot of folks were sort of talking about hope and, and talking about um, looking at the MECFS community and wondering whether, you know, looking at their recovery rates, 5%, et cetera, um, how do we hold on to hope? I, I think two things. Um, one, to look at all of us who are publicly out there talking about recovery, all the people who have recovered, um, all the people who are doing better, uh, and all the media representations of that. Um, and the other is to try and hold in your mind what it felt like last time you felt better and to try and draw on that in terms of imagery so that you can bring that almost to sort of full feeling in your body in those moments when you feel awful. Does that make sense? It does. Um, and I, I, there's another question that sort of comes out of this as well, which is how do we cope with this, um, the limbo situation that we're in between accepting the new status quo and holding on to hope of recovery? Because that yeah. sort of means that it's hard for us to maybe fully grieve our old life or accept the new place and come to a place of peace because we're still hoping to get back to that place of recovery. So again, there's yeah. this kind of, we're trying to hold two sort of impossible things in each hand. Yeah, I mean, obviously being mindful that that, that is a difficult thing to do. Um, I think the thing about acceptance, um, is definitely more easy to understand when we come back to thinking about the fight or flight versus rest or digest question, um, because there are some things about the autonomic nervous system and depending on which state you're in, um, that acceptance won't be as easy to do. Um, so I know that acceptance is spoken about a lot and it's sort of put out there as a healthy psychological recovery strategy, but we not may not be able to access it if we're not in the right autonomic state. Um, and the hope piece, you know, I think, again, personally, it was the thing that got me through, you know, it's the thing that helps you find persistence, it's the thing that helps you find uh, a way to keep going. Um, a lot of people were asking questions about, you know, how do we get that balance between constantly researching new treatments and trying to find answers versus resting and, and uh, doing all those good things. And, and I would say, if I hadn't done all that research, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now. I wouldn't be feeling as much better as I am although that's not perfect, it's definitely much better than this time last year. Um, so I think it's, you know, on the one hand, you can let us do the research for you, you can let us do the hope for you um, and draw on that. On the other hand, if you've got it within you, I think it's important to keep using it as a, as a hook to keep going to give you that persistence um, and not beat yourself up about, oh, but I'm supposed to be accepting, oh, but I'm supposed to be this and that, um, because that's why we get into trouble when we beat ourselves up for doing the things that we're not supposed to be doing. I think that's, you know, and we touched on this last time, you know, letting yourself off the hook. If you're having a crappy day, go with it. If you feel awful, go with it. That is allowed. And if you feel hope, go with that. That's also very much allowed. Um, so you have started that, you were talking a little bit about the sort of what autonomic state we're in. 
And yeah. one of the questions that came up was just about trying to clarify sort of the hierarchy, if you like, if there is one yeah. of those autonomic states. I was just wondering if you could just sort of speak a little bit more detail about that. Yeah, and I think it's easier if I pull something up on the screen because I know that we're all dealing with cognitive stuff and it's nice to see something that is a bit visual. Um, so very crude, um, but just to kind of show us this is the sort of traditional way of thinking about the autonomic nervous system, that you have these two systems, rest and digest versus fight or flight, and that they're sort of supposed to be in equilibrium and that we're in trouble because our fight or flight is just on the whole time and we don't get any rest or digest. So that's how we sort of used to think about this. Um, and coming on to the stuff that is being much more talked about in the psychology world now and in other fields, this polyvagal theory, which is based on Stephen Porges's work from really from the 60s onwards, but I think it's getting a lot of airtime now, um, thinking about these three levels, and we touched on this new one at the bottom last time, immobilization, um, but it's really helpful to think, it, think about it as a sort of bottom up three levels so and and also the colors you know we all resonate slightly differently with color um but some sort of negative color at the bottom um going into something sort of crisis based and then at the top something sort of calm um so you've got um that immobilization which um stephen porges refers to as dorsal vagal so you may hear that term sometimes um then we've got our sympathetic which is fight or flight in the middle there um, and then the top level is that green parasympathetic rest or digest, which sometimes now is also referred to as ventral vagal. Um, and just to say a little bit more about what's in those levels, because lots of people were asking, what is this immobilization thing? How do I know when I'm in it? How do I know when I'm out of it? Um, and what can be a really useful exercise for all of us is to plot out our own experience of this sort of hierarchy, or sometimes it's referred to as a ladder. Um, so down at the bottom there, you've got uh, the shutdown fatigue, uh, which also for most of us who have GI symptoms also includes that constipation phase and that brain fog. So if you're dealing with any of those things, you are more than likely in immobilization. Another thing that's really characteristic of immobilization is that our facial expression is much more limited. Um, because if you look at the green at the top there, that's where we're super social and connected to people. Um, and so if you are feeling very not social, very disconnected from humans, um, and if you notice that your tone of voice is different, uh, maybe a bit more monotonous and that your facial expressions are a little more limited, those are also signs of being in immobilization. Um, the fight or flight, I think we're all very familiar with, which is that sort of panicked, anxiety-driven crisis state. Uh, that also is where uh, we're going to have nightmares within our insomnia, obviously with you, when you're shut down in that kind of fatigue state, you may also have insomnia, but probably won't be having nightmares anymore. Um, a lot of folks talk about nightmares. I definitely had very vivid, awful nightmares. That's very much kind of the fight or flight piece. Um, and also this idea, people talk about mobilization, and that doesn't mean that you've got lots of lovely energy and can do fun activities, it's almost like that sort of can't sit still negative energy, which of course you need if you're doing fight and if you're doing flight. Um, but that also in a GI um, context can mean that you wind up having diarrhea. So I know that we often with GI symptoms are going backwards and forwards between those two states. And that this is why, because we're going backwards and forwards between fight or flight and immobilization. And our gut, which is the end of that whole vagus nerve system, doesn't know what to do with itself because it's constantly being pulled in one direction or the other. Um, and then the lovely green bit at the top, which we're all aiming for, is, is the social connection is there, gratitude is there, acceptance is there, self-compassion is there. 
and again, we touched on this last time, but a message that I'm really trying to share as much as possible is if you are struggling with gratitude, if you are struggling with acceptance, if you are struggling with self-compassion, that's probably because you're not in rest and digest and it's not your fault. Um, so being thoughtful about what can I do to help myself get back towards those states, which we touched on a little bit last time and, and we can talk more about today as well. So, so is that kind of making more sense, Jess? Yeah, hugely. Um, yeah. And the interesting thing for me here as well is, you know, it's not always apparent when you're in fight or flight. Um, yeah. It's sometimes I only realize when I finally slip into parasympathetic and sometimes it's, it's an intellectual intervention, which is I have not stopped or I have not taken time out to breathe or done any of this stuff in too long a period. And I sit down, I plug in my alpha stim to turn it up to maximum, start doing some breathing. And then I get these like compulsive yawns that come out of nowhere. And that's my body telling me that like, oh God, now I'm lurching out of the fight or flight and maybe trying to find my way back to parasympathetic. But I hadn't realized that I wasn't there. And you can go for days or weeks stuck in that fight or flight without realizing it until you try and make some sort of intervention to actually interrupt those patterns. Um, so are there yeah. any signs that we can be aware of that, you know, maybe because we, we're not always jittery or, or sometimes we might be jittery and not realize it. Um, so yeah. how do we know when we're in that fight or flight and how do we know when we're out I, of it? I think it's, it is about trying to figure it out based on sort of paying attention to your body and noticing what you can notice um, and then sort of filling out that picture more and more over time. So if you have a, an experience where you uh, know that you're suddenly back into parasympathetic again, just to think back, oh, wait a second, what was I experiencing there? Are there any clues that I can notice that I was in fight or flight? And just writing that out in a sort of hierarchical diagram um, so that you can begin to understand your nervous system and how it works. And, and I think because it's autonomic, you know, it happens automatically. And so most of us are not aware of when we're in these different levels and, um, and that's okay. That's sort of how humans are designed. But because of long COVID, we've gotten stuck. It suddenly becomes super relevant to be aware of, of what's happening and, and to figure it out a little bit more. Um, and in, in fact, Jez, one thing that I am hoping to do going forward uh, is to offer some free workshops where folks get the chance to jump on a Zoom call and, and do a bit of this plotting out there, kind of polyvagal hierarchy, um, because I think this is a question I get asked a lot and it's not super easy to do by yourself. Um, I had hoped, I thought I had the dates in my mind and I was going to advertise it over the weekend and then something came up on one of the dates that I had picked and so I'm going to have to go back to my calendar and rejig it but um watch the space that, that's definitely something I'd love to be offering going forward because I think this is so crucial to us being able to navigate this psychologically I couldn't agree yeah. more um right. so um, so the question and one of the other questions that taps into this as well is like how, how what do we do about all the symptoms we're feeling and trying to be mindful of them and yeah. but not get caught up in an obsession with them how is that yeah. a balance that we find and i think again it, it becomes about noticing what are the signs of where you are kind of polyvagally rather than dwelling on specific symptoms in that sort of tracking way. And I don't know if you got this info, Jez, early on in, in your illness, but lots of people told me, oh, you should be tracking symptoms. And I tried lots of different apps to track them. And um, I think I sort of knew in my gut that it wasn't helpful to me. And yet I was constantly being bombarded with the message that I should do it. Um, and ultimately, I don't think it is helpful to us to just track symptoms. I think it's much more helpful to just be sort of tuning into your body. Where am I today? Am I in the black? Am I in the red? Am I a little bit, a little bit of green? For example, I was um, teaching on Friday morning, the first time I'd done a grand rounds presentation to doctors talking about long COVID. 
Um, and I just noticed sort of about halfway through, because I was dealing with kind of some new tech setup and I was also on WebEx, which is not my favorite, Zoom is my favorite, just noticed that tightness in my chest coming on. And that for me is a sign. Obviously I was gonna be in that um, sympathetic in order to be giving a good presentation. You need to have that mobilization, a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of focus, but that chest pain was a sign for me that I was just moving down towards immobilization. And obviously while presenting, you can't do anything, but it was a red flag to me when we were done that I had to do some things to sort myself out and move back up again. And I think that's how we want to be paying attention to it. Where am I on the ladder? What level am I at? What are my signs? Um, and just helping us to be more flexible in terms of moving back up rather than just constantly counting, um, you know, how's your stomach pain today? How's your chest pain today? Which just focuses on awfulness. I agree. Um, yeah. So we had a couple of questions come in around parenting um, and the roles of either being a parent with long COVID or being a parent and dealing with a child who's got long COVID. Um, yeah. So I just thought I would put that past you because there's obviously multiple challenges with regards to that, but neither of us are parents. So, yeah. <laughs> and sadly, when, you know, in my former life as a psychologist, uh, working with children was also not my specialty. So I certainly can't, you know, I haven't worked extensively with parents in that way. But a couple of things that come to mind. Um, firstly, um, if you are a parent of someone with long COVID, um, being aware of this polyvagal stuff and understanding it so that you can support your child with where they are on the ladder is really relevant. And in fact, I did notice that the Polyvagal Institute does have a training for parents right now, which is on demand on their website. Um, so we can put that in the comments if parents want to click through and take a look at that. It will really help you figure out what's going on with your child. Some of the things that I mentioned, you will be able to spot in them and then support them moving back up again. Um, from the perspective of being a, someone who has long COVID and has kids, and I, I think the question came in the context of how do you manage when they don't understand that you have long COVID and expect you to do more, um, which I think is getting a little bit into the topic of trauma and gaslighting, which we had lots of questions on. Um, but something that I would say, which is also relevant to all of us, is that thing around boundaries. Um, and especially in the case of, of younger children, right? They don't know what you need unless you make it clear to them. And in the case of younger children, it's not telling them what you need, it's showing them what you need so that they can see behaviorally what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and I know, you know, and I've heard a lot of folks talking about how guilty they feel about not being able to be the parent that they used to be. And so it's completely understandable in those experiences that you are gonna start feeling guilty and then pulled to do more because of those thoughts that you might be experiencing and I'm here to give you permission that that's not the case if you know what you need in terms of your pacing in terms of your activity levels um, you need to hold that boundary um, and then you know who else can you call on if if your kids need to go to the park or they need to do this or that you won't be able to do it are there other people that can help you out um, with that so knowing your limits and holding them, not expecting your kids to understand. And, and I think that's something that also applies to us, you know, more generally, adults interacting with adults, knowing the boundary and holding your boundary is, is really important. Um, so yeah, so speaking about sort of trauma and gaslighting and the various different ways, how do we deal with people around us sort of denying or minimizing our experience? because that can be a very difficult thing to deal with, whether it comes from family members or people you'd hope to be supportive or whether it comes from, you know, clinicians or people in the medical community. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, this is something that all of us have experienced a great deal. Um, and the questions that we got were, you know, on, on all of those levels, how do I deal with gaslight from doctors? How do I deal with gaslighting from myself? Um, I think the first thing I would want to address is that, you know, 
especially those of us in the first wave, we all had those thoughts initially. Am I just making this up? Is there something wrong with me? Perhaps I am just a bit anxious. Perhaps I am a bit stressed. And what I would want to say is now we're such a huge cohort of people that that cannot possibly be true. Uh, again and again and again and again, the evidence is overwhelming that this is a physiological illness. Um, and in fact, I was just chatting with a friend at the weekend who reminded me that after the Spanish flu, um, people had physiological disability for decades. Um, so it, you know, everywhere you look, the evidence is irrefutable that this is a physical illness. Um, and if you are doubting yourself for one second, all you have to do is open up social media and see the millions of us who are out there to confirm that you're not wrong. Um, so that's something to, you know, that's really important to do. Um, when it comes to friends and family, I think the difficulty is, and you know, the last five years, regardless of which country you live in, have illustrated this very clearly, that none of us can change the beliefs of another person, no matter how much we go at them with the evidence or what we think. Um, so that's super tough, um, but what you can do um, is take care of yourself um, and, be mindful of what you need. And if the people around you are not agreeing with that or providing that, then it becomes a case of changing the people around you. And I think we talked about that last time, you know, finding your people, sticking with your people. And if that means that you don't spend time with particular family members or particular friends because they don't agree with what you're going through, then that is how it has to be. Um, that uh, we need to pre protect ourselves and take care of ourselves and, and because otherwise that trauma will make this polyvagal stuff worse. Um, I think somebody was asking a question about um, how do we deal with the fact that we've obviously all experienced intense trauma from this gaslighting. Um, and Obviously, trauma is talked about a lot in the media nowadays, um, and unfortunately, there are a few myths that get perpetuated that we're supposed to tell our story and that it's important to share and all of those things. From a psychological perspective, it actually isn't. And by that, I don't mean you're supposed to keep quiet and hide it and keep the secret, because obviously that's not true either. Um, but just, you know, narrating your story completely including the trauma and the trauma events is really just re-traumatizing yourself and perpetuating that trauma. So, you know, this thing that's talked about around trauma debriefing or whatever, you know, language you give to it isn't actually that effective or helpful. Um, obviously, we want to connect with each other and we want to get community from each other and that's great, but don't feel you need to share your story. Um, but what is important is that we give each other validation, you know, the I see you, I hear you, um, and hopefully these videos, you know, are giving that message, certainly the, the feedback that we got last time suggested that they were, um, so if you are feeling not seen or heard, again, reaching out just to get that from somebody, you don't have to tell your whole story, we believe you, we know what you've been through, even without telling us. Um, and then again, thinking about the physiological perspective of trauma, trauma is physiological in the body and it does cause permanent changes in the body that are related to the, the hierarchy that we've been talking about. You're more likely to be in immobilization or fight or flight if you've been through trauma. And the way to treat trauma is the ways that we are already treating those experiences. Um, so that's helpful because we're talking about this vagus nerve stuff so much that it's hard to get away from it now and more, you know, whatever you're learning that works for you that helps you move out of immobilization or fight or flight, those are the things to also do to soothe your body in response to trauma. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind um, that it has a, a double effect, which is, is great. And obviously, when it comes to processing trauma, uh, you know, pre-COVID in the rest of our lives, a lot of us may have turned to therapy to do so. Um, yeah. What kind of therapy is helpful and productive with long COVID? 
in your experience? What would yeah, you Yeah, like? that's a, a really great question. I mean, I personally um, wound up switching from one therapist to another um, about halfway through last year. And um, I did so looking for somebody that focuses in working with chronic illness. Uh, I did try and find somebody who had some experience of working with long COVID. And at that time, uh, there were not many people, not surprisingly. Um, but I think the thing that's really key for all of us, again, given this medical gaslighting, if you go, especially in America, but I think also in the UK still, uh, if you go to therapy and you don't find someone who focuses in chronic illness, they're going to have to give you a mental health diagnosis in order to um, you know, write in your records and, and justify the treatment that they're giving to you. So that's a worry if you've been told you've got depression, if you've been told you've got anxiety, and you know full well that these are just responses to long COVID. Uh, it's really important to find a therapist that works with chronic illness because they're going to use the DSM code that says you have depression due to dealing with a medical issue or you have anxiety due to dealing with a medical issue. Um, and then even if they don't have experience with long COVID, they're also going to have um, experience with a lot of other conditions that have similar psychological manifestations. So things like multiple sclerosis, especially folks who have relapsing remitting MS have kind of a similar trajectory to us in terms of that hope and then despondency um, that we've touched upon already today. Um, or things like MECFS, which of course we know have a lot of parallels with us. Um, so that would be my top tip if you are looking for someone to help you with the psychological impact on you of having long COVID. Um, the other possibility, if you are feeling very traumatized and overwhelmed by that, and especially if you've noticed um, which we also spoke a little bit about in the last video, that maybe you had some other traumas in your life before this that you hadn't really addressed, um, then looking for an evidence-based trauma therapy is going to be really helpful. Um, and the options there are EMDR, which is obviously talked about a lot, um, but there are a few other evidence-based treatments for um, trauma, such as prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy, trauma-focused CBT, which brings us to the CBT question. Um, if you are doing trauma-focused CBT, I think that's probably a time when it's okay to be using CBT approaches because they're just gonna be focusing on that trauma element. Um, but I wouldn't recommend a general CBT therapist for long COVID. Um, I know I did uh, in my intro last time, explained that I am a psychologist and that I am trained in CBT. Um, and in fact, in the UK where I trained, almost everybody's trained in CBT. It's hard to get through training clinically without learning CBT. Um, and to make it very clear that I do not believe that CBT is a treatment for long COVID. Um, although full disclosure, I did go through... Um, when I was training, that is what we were trained in. Um, and I do have, and uh, I haven't burnt it. I'm debating whether I'm going to write a little note in the front and send it back to her. Uh, Trudy Childers' book about CBT for chronic fatigue. Um, and I did treat a couple of patients when I was um, a trainee who had, uh, one was chronic pain, I think one was CFS. Um, and when I first had long COVID, I definitely looked at all those materials again. Um, thankfully, very quickly, I saw the conversation that was happening uh, and read those GET papers and the criticisms of those papers. Um, and then I went back and looked at Judith's book and I thought, my God, this is just awful. I cannot believe that people were perpetuating this myth. Um, and I definitely now, I can't even believe that they're putting CBT in long COVID clinics. I think that is, is a travesty, to be honest. Um, so yeah, if you're using CBT in the context of trauma, I think that's okay because CBT is evidence-based and incredibly effective for trauma. Um, the right CBT treatments, not just general CBT. Um, 
but otherwise I would not touch it with a barge pole, to be honest. And I think that's the viewpoint of 99.9% .9 of our audience as well. Yes. Um, so let's try and do a bit of a sort of a whistle stop round. I'm just going to fire some yeah. questions at you quickly because we have kind of covered some of these before, but it's nice to kind of go over them again, I think. Um, yeah. So what do we do in our dark moments when it feels like all is lost? Yeah, um, I think, again, the first thing to really do is it is OK to feel your feelings. And I know that we don't want to do that. And I know when we feel awful, um, it's the last thing we want to do, but ultimately it does get us to a better place. Um, and I know there were some questions about, okay, fine, but how do I do that? Um, and a couple of things that, um, three things that I sort of alternate between. Um, one is a strategy which is stolen from DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, which I'm not fully trained in, but I used to work with a lot of people who are, uh, this thing called observe and describe, which basically means paying attention to your body and describing to yourself what you're noticing. Um, so that can be really helpful that you just turn the focus inwards and describe the physiological sensations in your body and then give a name to the emotions that are accompanying them. Um, and most of us, when we're feeling an intense feeling, usually only notice that. But if we stop and pay attention, um, there may be a bunch of other feelings lurking there too that it's useful to give voice to. Um, I know for me, the big one was always anger. Um, but underneath anger, there can be a whole host of other things that are important to examine. Um, Another strategy that's really, really, really helpful is journaling. Um, and the way that I do that is just open up a blank Word document on my laptop and just type out everything that I'm thinking and feeling. Um, and then after about 20, 30 minutes, delete the entire thing and then save the blank screen just to be sure so that if somebody opens it up and goes back, they don't see the verbatim of nastiness that I just left on the screen there. Um, and I find that incredibly helpful. You know, for example, if you've just been to a doctor's appointment and been gaslit again by a doctor, that's the perfect way to get all of that out. Everything that you wanted to say to the doctor in the moment, you know, what a slimy little whatever, 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 just write that all out. And I am furious and I am feeling this and I'm feeling that and I'm disappointed and I'm let down and just write it and write it and write it. We can do that with family members. We can do that with friends. Um, so that I find incredibly helpful as a strategy. Um, and the last one is the closest we can often get to acceptance if we are stuck in immobilization or fight or flight is to just say to ourselves, what does this feel like now? And that's probably the closest you can do to that sort of, this is where I am and it's okay to just ask yourself, what does this feel like now? And just keep asking yourself, what does it feel like now until you felt it enough that it dissipated? Very good advice. Um, how about when we're faced with indecision? Because the stakes to pretty much all the decisions we make now are so much higher because we yeah. don't know how our body's going to react. We don't know if we're going to be able to do it, whether it's a question of starting a new treatment, whether it's a question of, do I take on this job? Uh, do I try and yeah. work? Do I try and go away? You know, how, what's the best way for us to handle that? Yeah, I mean, I would go back to the trust your gut. Um, and ultimately, if we do stop and pay attention, our body knows and it, and, and it is telling us where we need to go. Um, and if you make a mistake, again, not to beat yourself up. Um, I went and had acupuncture again on Friday in the context of a running injury that has come back again. And I thought that I was doing better enough that I could get away with acupuncture this time. Cause previously when I tried it, I always crashed right after. 
and of course my body battery, battery hemorrhaged over the weekend and is only just coming up again today now. So, you know, don't beat yourself up. Okay. I thought I was going to do better. I didn't. Now I know I definitely can't do acupuncture again and I'm not going to do acupuncture again. What is it that I need to do instead? I think my body knows, let me just pursue that. Um, so I would say a little bit of reaching out to the community to bounce ideas off of, you know, that's what Facebook groups are for. Um, has anybody tried this treatment? How did you like it? How did your body respond? Um, and then going back to your gut um, in terms of what do I think is going to happen? And when it comes to big things, activity related, again, I think we usually have a little voice in the back of our head that is telling us the right answer. Um, you know, when I was thinking about flying to London at Christmas, is this going to be right for me? Yes, it is. I do need to just go ahead and push myself and not use this as an excuse to stay home. Um, should I be getting out there and running, you know, marathons again? Absolutely not. Um, and, and I think those are the answers we know, right? When it comes to work, you know how many hours in a day you are good for. Is the job going to accommodate that? If they're not, then you know that you can't do it. But there will be a job that will accommodate it. Or, you know, can you work independently, freelance or self-employed or that sort of thing? You know what you can do. Pay attention to that and make sure that other people know and then they can respond to it. It's interesting what you're saying about your reaction to acupuncture. Because there's a few yeah. treatments that people have which shake out, I mean, in a very non-technical, specific uh, terminology, shake out a load of crap, you know, whether it's lymphatic massage or craniosopathy or any of this sort of stuff. And acupuncture can do it too, where people immediately afterwards, you feel absolutely drained for a day or two. And then after that, you're slightly better again. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know yeah, quite we'll, what acupuncture we'll see. having, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it technically sports acupuncture, but the guy that does it is, is very much chained in the Chinese stuff. So he's, he's really doing that. Um, I, was, I was pleased that right afterwards on Friday, I didn't feel like crap. Whereas the, you know, the last few times, I mean, the last time I went now was before last summer. So that's kind of over six months ago. Um, but previously, I was definitely finding that it would totally wipe me out. And then I'd feel like crap. Um, we'll see if I get any positive benefits later this week. Um, but it, it's also balancing that, you know, I think there's, there's only so many things that make you feel worse before you feel better that we can go through. And again, going back to your original question about balancing, you know, the days when you've done better, the days when you felt worse and you're losing hope again, in order to keep the hope going, once you start to recover sufficiently, you can't keep putting yourself right back because then that's going to mess with the hope at the beginning when everything is awful and, and you couldn't get any worse and you think you've hit rock bottom, then we're all willing to try anything because what is there to lose? And I, I think it's keeping that in mind. Um, and if you feel like you are okay to lose a little bit, knowing that you will ultimately make a gain, then that's great. Um, I think Personally, I might be at that point where I'm so happy enjoying the gains that I'm not willing to give them up, even if it's for 48 hours. Um, and, and, and that's an OK decision to make. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've got one final question, and this may be unanswerable. Um, is there anything we can do to reinstill values of humility and empathy in the medical community? Now, my, my feeling is that yes. the system, I mean, I... In the UK, at least, the NHS, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, maybe you can't if you're in the States at the moment, there's a new series called This Is Going to Hurt, based upon a uh, doctor called Adam Kay, who wrote a book a few years ago. But it's absolutely brutal in terms of illustrating just how oh, hard the NHS is to work for, in terms of it yeah. not valuing you as a human being. And if yeah. you're not valued as a human being by the environment you're in, it's very difficult for you to then value the human beings in front of you because the system itself simply does not reward or yeah. uh, incentivize that. Um, and this is obviously what we find when we go and see doctors, you know, a lot of the time with a relatively invisible chronic condition. 
So yeah. is there anything that we can do to try and help that that community find those values of sort of humility and empathy again? Yeah, I mean, I I personally am trying to do it with with some of the speaking stuff that I'm doing. So Friday, I did my first um, grand rounds on long COVID, and I basically spent an hour telling a bunch of doctors and other allied health professionals that they need to stop gaslighting us. And it was actually pretty well received. Um, so I think it's it's being mindful of you know where you are. And, and how to talk to people. Um, so when I'm presenting as a patient, that's not the time to do advocacy because you're just seen as a stupid patient and nobody's gonna to respond to you. Um, but those of us who work in the health system and have the privilege of being considered a peer at times, then, then that you can use that to your advantage, you know. And I went in with all my best medical language and used all the buzzwords that they use. And, and then you can get in there sneakily and present a message from the inside out. So, you know, I know that there are millions of us who worked formally in healthcare, whether that be the NHS or, or other health systems. Um, and if you are well enough and have the opportunity to be doing these things, then that definitely is going to make a difference. Um, and it's it's picking your moments and picking your battles and knowing how to, to do this. You know, I think, yes, I do completely understand. I've worked in the NHS. I was trained within the NHS. I know what doctors go through in terms of their training and the bits that they are omitted psychologically you know the the bedside manner of doctors has gotten a lot better um, back in the day they deliberately were told in medical school that you need to be distant and you need to be cut off in order to protect themselves now I think that isn't the message that's given but yes they do go through a lot and I can completely empathize and that's still not good enough and I think we need to hold people accountable for sure and keep using our voices and and making a fuss whether that's on twitter or you know whether it's at, at grand round presentations or whatever it is um especially those of us who have kind of dual identities of being both a healthcare professional and a long covid uh long hauler that's i think where we're going to get a bit of traction and i know there was a a brilliant article in the guardian about doctors who've been gaslit by their own colleagues in their own departments uh which is absolutely horrific and heartbreaking and i can't imagine i would be so furious if my own colleagues had treated me like that um and you know again that those are maybe ways that we can move stuff forward um I'm sure plenty of people read that article and maybe some of them had a little bit of remorse uh, and shame about their behavior towards long haulers. I hope so. I hope so too. Um, well, thank you so much again for your time, Sally. Um, uh, if we do get some uh, information about when you might be doing those workshops, um, then we can put that yes. in the description for the film. So Absolutely. people can have a look at that. Um, and this conversation can go on in the comments and on Twitter. Um, and if we get another wave of questions, maybe we'll <laughs> we'll be we'll talking with, with a bunch more. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. Thanks wonderful. so much, Jess. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.